Art is a highly diverse range of human activities engaged in creating visual, auditory or performed works and artworks that expresses the person's imaginative or technical skill and are intended to be appreciated for their beauty or emotional power. So art involves creativity, appreciation and the very act of creation. But why do we connect art and ethics? I believe it's very important to link the two. Let me give you three reasons. The first, art and ethics coming together gives guidance and it directs. Art by itself, I believe, is amoral. A thing of beauty can give you happiness, joy and, and life. But a thing of beauty can also cause unhappiness, misery and death. You will notice that I am using the word beauty for art, though beauty and aesthetics is only part of art. It is not surprising that ancient Greeks considered truth, goodness and beauty as divine concepts. And Socrates and Plato elevated them to eternal, transcendent words, world of ideas, of forms. This has profoundly influenced Western civilizations and prominent philosophers through the centuries. We see a similar concept uh, in the East, uh, in the ancient Indian civilization, the triad Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram is similar. Satyam for truth, uh, Shivam for God, goodness or bliss, and Sundaram for beauty. The second point is, Art and ethics gives purpose. I will quote you the first two lines of the book by the father of medicine, Hippocrates, which was written in the 4th century BC. The book is called Aphorisms. Life is short and art long. The crisis fleeting, experience is perilous and decisions difficult. The, phys the physician must not only be prepared to do what is right himself, but also to make the patient and the attendants and the externals cooperate. The art in this context denotes the skill, the skill to create and to do things, which, you know, as a physician, he is also expecting that as an art. So appreciate in creating, he implies, takes time, but life is finite. Life is short and art long. What we think, what we relish and what we create and share will define who we are and the legacy we leave behind after our short, brief life. So does our art help us to live life in a fulfilling manner, being useful to others and being happy? The third point is art can lift up ethics. To make this point, I will quote Alexander Saul Sinistrin from his uh, Nobel lecture on literature when he received the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1970. And the lecture is called Beauty Will Save the World. Note that he's speaking about beauty in the context of, uh, in, in the triad of truth, good, goodness and beauty. I quote, If the two obvious, so straight branches of truth and good are crushed or amputated and cannot reach the light. Yet perhaps the whimsical, unpredictable, unexpected branches of beauty will make their way through and soar up to that very place and in this way perform the work of all the three. In that case, it is not a slip of the tongue of Dostoevsky to say that beauty will save the world, but a prophecy." End quote. Now I move into uh, how these linkages of art and ethics plays out at three levels and what we can do about it. The first point is valuing art. I believe that the capacity to appreciate and manifest art and create it is universally present in all. Each person's art and artistry is to be valued and appreciated in their own context. I believe that the financialization and monetization of art 
has many ethical challenges and the very ad hoc and subjective valuing of art has much to do with social, economic, cultural, political and racial and ethnic dynamics. The financial valuing of the piece of art depends on the desirability of the piece and the level of wealth people are willing to spend on it and the possibility for it to be traded. So art has become a tool for the concentration of wealth and assets. An interesting illustration of this challenge is the still life painting of a flower vase by Dutch master Jan van Heusen, painted in the early 18th century, which was stolen from the Uffizi Gallery in Florence by retreating Nazi soldiers in 1943. Currently, we are in the final stages of the returning of the painting by the family who currently possesses it in Germany to the gallery in Italy after long and difficult negotiations. On one hand, from the cultural standpoint, the painting is priceless, but from a commercial standpoint, worthless. As no legitimate auction house will sell the painting, would sell the painting due to the legal connotations of dealing with a publicly known stolen item. So our valuing of art should not be decided by the market. But then how will we value it? I would suggest that it is suggest that it is valued in the way it contributes to the well-being and happiness of those it is intended for. For instance, the music played and the stories told and the decor used for a preschool or a kindergarten will be very different from the art we use for a nightclub. Uh, I give you a very stark example, but in reality, things are much more blurred. So we need to be discerning and wise and need a lot of discussions and conversations with those people who are concerned uh, uh, with, uh, you know, experiencing uh, the, the, the impacts of the decision uh, to make such uh, decision and value. The second point is artists themselves. Many artists and artisans are exploited today by middlemen to create beautiful objects for others. This is not new. This has happened through history. But our religious texts, I mean, I'm referring to the Bible, uh, shows how artists were recognized and named in the building of the tabernacle. This is the, the place of worship when the Israelites were a nomadic people moving from Egypt to the promised land. So the tabernacle was a place of worship and the, and the Bible, in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, in Exodus chapter 35 to 37, it explains how it was built and who built it. It by name recognizes the carpenters, the metal workers, jewelers, silver and gold smiths and the weavers and values their, their work. But we should also remember that all these artists were part of the community of enslaved people escaping uh, from Egypt. So probably they were not valued by the pharaohs or pharaoh of, or the royalty of Egypt as they were recognized by their own community. So when we buy a piece of art object, we need to try to understand where it comes from and whether the person or communities, persons, persons or communities who created it benefits from your purchase. The final point we need to consider is the message itself. Where, what message does the art give? Is there art distorting truths and promoting misinformation or worse, inflame hatred and anger and precipitate conflicts? The message can distort from very, from, in a very subtle manner, undermining uh, one's culture and identity or it could manipulate purchasing behavior, it could market products without saying, saying it clearly, or it could be outright propaganda. But on the other hand, art can also be used to promote positive behavioral change. This is very important, especially in an era where the communication technology has advanced, information has been democratized, and the role of social media and uh, communications have become, have taken a very, very prominent position in our society. Let me give you an example from history where truth was told in a very uh, effective manner with art. 
Francisco Goya, I'm referring to the court painter, who who was the, who became the court painter to the Spanish crown in 1786. But in 1807, and, 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 and actually his, his earlier career was marked by portraits of Spanish aristocracy and royalty and designing tapestry for the palace. In 1807, Napoleon Bonaparte led the French army into the Peninsula War against Spain and the following years of war deeply hurt the people of Spain and of course of also France and affected uh, Goya uh, also who shared in the suffering. During the period Goya created the series uh, of 82 haunting macabre and poignant etchings known as the disasters of war as a powerful reminder of the inhumane consequences of warfare. The imagery Goya created uh, for this 19th century series is not pleasant, but this is by design. Instead of a heroic depiction of battles, Goya sought to convey the tragic results of violent conflicts through his harsh, realistic etchings. In fact, Goya is, I would consider him, the ancestor of all war photographers and correspondents. The disaster of wars remains one of the boldest anti-war statements ever made, reminding all that war can bring out the worst in humanity. In conclusion, friends, I believe that it is important that we consider art as part of our life and to hold it close to truth and goodness and, of course, ethical conduct. Let us continue to be creative and appreciate create creation itself and in all that we appreciate, think, create, do and consume. Let us do so with empathy and compassion, always caring about the impact on others. Thank you.